Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Sleep Like a Boss podcast. I have a very special guest, Emily Barkley. I'm super excited to have Emily here. You're going to be up for some laughs today, I think. Um, hi, Emily. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to briefly give you a very little bit of background. We're going to dive into Emily's um, story in depth. Emily is based in the UK. Um, Emily... Um, is an expert, I would say, in the topic of perimenopause. She, a few years ago, founded the Perimenopause Hub to give women who struggle in perimenopause or who have questions with perimenopause um, access to experts and other people to discuss questions that might come up where they might run up against the wall with their doctors potentially, or they just want a second opinion. And yeah, you've hit like... I don't know if you stung in a bee's nest or what we want to call it, but your Facebook group has grown to nearly 50,000 people. So five zero, and there's only women allowed in that group. And it is, I'm in, I'm in the group as well. It's a very active group. There's a lot of people um, interacting with each other and it is amazing how it seems to be that there is a real, real need for women to have that exchange, to have access to information about that topic. So I, I personally think I said it yesterday in one of the comments, I think you're changing the world, you're changing women's lives with what you're doing. And I'm so grateful for what you're doing. Um, but why are you doing it? Like, how did you come about this? I'm going to change the world in, with perimenopause. Like, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what happened there? So where do I start? Um, <laughs> my background is not medical. Um, so this came about because my story is very similar to a lot of women in perimenopause's story. Um, in my mid thirties, I started doing a lot of triathlons and I was the fittest I'd ever been and it was all lovely. And then when I got to about 39, suddenly lots of things changed and I didn't know what was going on. I was exhausted. I was angry. I was gaining weight. I wasn't sleeping. I was having weird periods, but I was only 39, right? Mm -hmm. So it must have just been something else. And it took three and a half years, 13 different doctor visits, endless blood tests and scans and whatever. I genuinely at one point hoped I had a thyroid problem. I hoped that would come back in the blood tests because I just wanted an answer. Mm -hmm. and finally three and a half years on um by which point I had tracked all my symptoms I had pulled them out of the app that I was using because it didn't have a download option and I put them all into excel so that I could then make graphs and see if there was any sort of a pattern and there was and it was just I was like oh there's a pattern I can see that my lowest energy is just before my period I can see there was just all these things that suddenly made sense mm -hmm. that it was hormonal and bearing in mind from the age of what 16 until about 35 I'd been on the combined pill so my periods had just done what they did you know I'd been aware of a couple of things like I knew I was a bit clumsy the day before my period that was about it I didn't and that's probably where you think like everybody kind of has that, right? It's kind of yeah. normal. And when you're on the period, you don't even know what's going on with your hormones anyhow, right? For like yeah. 20 years, you had no reason to believe that something was wrong because it was all regulated, right? Yeah, because it, and frankly, looking back, maybe I'd had issues all the way through, but I'd just, you know, quashed no. them. Down. And because I never wanted to have kids, I never had that thing of needing to get to know my cycle or anything so I didn't even know what normal looked like normal non-medicated I didn't know my only point of reference was when I was like 15 well you know things are still a bit weird when you're 15 <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Your cycle. um so yeah so it was really strange and sort of finally identifying that this was going with my cycle and there was a definite pattern to it just was like you know, the scales had dropped from my eyes or whatever the saying is. And I went and saw the doctor again. And we both agreed that what was going on was either chronic fatigue or it was perimenopause. But obviously I was by this point armed with all my lovely data. 
And so we agreed it was perimenopause. Hurrah, I had a word. Amazing. Honestly, I can't tell you how much of a weight lifted by simply understanding what was happening and understanding that, yeah, when I went through puberty, I was exhausted a lot of the time. I I was that, per- like, I was at boarding school when I was going through puberty and some of my peers would pull all-nighters to make sure they got their essays done on time and stuff. I'd be the one going to bed at seven o'clock in the evening because I needed so much sleep. And then on the weekends, maybe less so, I'd like go out partying on the weekends. <laughs> Obviously, I was a teenager. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> and so suddenly when I joined all the dots, I was like, oh, okay. So in that first puberty, I was tired because lots of things were happening in my body. Well, hang on a sec, maybe in this second puberty, I'm going to be quite tired because there's lots of stuff happening in my body. And actually, I'm not at death's door. <laughs> Nothing awful is happening to me. Just some things are changing. And just the weight that lifted mm-hmm. was phenomenal. And that, and what did you do once you had that diagnosis? <laughs> once I got that, I came home and Googled. I did okay. that thing you shouldn't do. <laughs> 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 but not I didn't google to try and find out all the terrible things and to you know self-diagnose or anything I was like what a word now I need to know more about it um and I was googling more to find support and to find help and to find answers and to because until that point as everything I knew about menopause was it happens in your 50s it's a few hot flushes and then your periods finish mm-hmm. literally that is all I knew mm-hmm. so suddenly being 42 and this having started at 39 and still very definitely having periods and and not having had a hot flush I'm like okay we're in uncharted territory here what the hell is going on so I was googling just to understand to understand what the full list of symptoms was to understand who else was in the same boat as me to to find support to find peers and I found a few groups on Facebook and stuff but very much they all seemed to be aimed at women who had already reached menopause so it was very much women who were in their 50s and I felt like I was I didn't realize until then that there can be quite a big gap between your early 40s and your your early 50s in a woman's life because early 40s a lot of your friends still have kids at home and around and that's still very much part of their life by early 50s a lot of them don't have kids at home and maybe are even moving into having grandkids that's a really big difference and so I just didn't feel like I belonged in those groups Mm -hmm. and then I also found a few things where say a nutritionist or or whatever practitioner was very much saying this is how you solve all hormonal problems I thought oh I'm not really ready for a this is how you solve all of it I want to understand and to find out what feels right for me rather than just some sort of top-down thing so um in my wisdom (laughs) I figured I'd just bring together some experts and set up a bit of a website and well why not have a Facebook group to go with it because you know putting a forum on a website is really expensive and quite hard work and Facebook already does that so that's literally where it came from (laughs) Wow. And it's amazing how it, yeah, how it's blown up. And it's slightly snowballed. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of grown quickly. Um, A little bit crazy. And it is, it is so interesting because we were talking a few weeks back and I was saying, because I came from Germany to Canada and I was like, and I started having hormonal problems with burnouts in my late thirties as well. And I started working with a practitioner and at some point, because she has women who are a little further than me now, or that word perimenopause fell. And I was like, you know, I'm a functional practitioner now too. But at that point, I was a nutritionist. I hadn't even heard of perimenopause. And then I was like, in German, I actually looked at, I was like, we don't even have a real word for that. Um, like that phase that could be however long. That's the thing before you hit menopause, right? Yeah. It's like, it's just not, it was like you said, it was like, it's, it was no man's land for a long time, I think. And I, I found it really confusing because 
in one of the doctors quite early on went oh this could be something to do with menopause and because my whole understanding of menopause actually rightly as it turned out is that your periods have ended I thought well how how and so finally getting the word perimenopause and understanding that that was the lead up to it I'm like oh gotcha puberty lasts a long time periods only start once perimenopause the first part of the menopause transition periods can only stop once makes sense but it was it was linguistically really confusing that there wasn't really any um emphasis given to this this sort of the time of the change before the actual sort of cessation of the periods Absolutely. And um, because you were mentioning some of the symptoms that are, I think, very common in what what women start experiencing. Um, Yeah. And the weight gain, the moods, maybe anxiety, even depression, right? There's all kinds of things, hot flashes, you name it. Uh, Yeah. Crying spells out of, it's like, yeah. Oh, you just watched a commercial and you're sitting on the couch bawling. (laughs) Yeah. There was, there was one, oh my God, it's, it's just terrible with hindsight. I got an email from dad. Now my dad is very eloquent and would never intentionally write anything upsetting to anyone. He used to be a lawyer. He has had to be very, very careful with his written word. And I somehow managed to find offense in this email and I sobbed for like two hours. I don't know what was wrong. I can't tell you what there was in the email that upset me so badly, but there was something in there that was nothing that just, I I just went back to bed and just sobbed for like literally two hours. It's terrifying. It is. If you actually, yeah, in that moment, if you have no clue what's going on and then you start that journey with doctors and they don't pinpoint it because I think they're getting better at it but yeah. even a few years ago it's like they had the same approach the what you're 39 no way you're even close to are you do you have regular periods yes yeah no this can't be a, a menopausal issue like most doctors would even dismiss that or would have dismissed it I think they are getting more careful yeah with it in, in making those calls to say no it, it's not that but it's still, and then you're there you're sitting there and you're like oh do I have to go see a therapist and the therapist might even say you know what fine I I, I can't you're good yeah I mean at one point I got told one doctor (laughs) this is just I mean it's laughable with hindsight it really wasn't at the time I went in and I'd got my post-it note with all the things that were wrong and I went this is happening and and I just don't feel like me and she glanced across from her computer at my list said oh you're stressed reached into the drawer gave me the leaflet for the well-being service you can self-refer. Thank you. And you know what? Yeah. And I find it so, and I hear this from clients a lot too with sleep. It is so dismissive. Yeah. And it's like, how many more times do you want to tell me I need to drink milk with honey or thank you for the sleep hygiene pamphlet alone? This might not be my problem. Like, can somebody listen to me and try to help me figure out what's actually going on? Yeah. Absolutely. And that was, I mean, she was so dismissive. It was just horrible. It was heartbreaking. And and because I know that that's not an isolated incident now, that breaks my heart even more. That breaks my heart that 50,000 women need the Facebook group because they are being dismissed elsewhere. That's not right. Mm-mm. Absolutely not. Um, which is why that group and, and what you've created is so amazing because there are so many different experts in their diet. So like mm-hmm. nutrition people, sleep people, stress management people, hormone specialists, um, yeah. fitness. fitness people, yeah. yoga people, all sorts. Hypnotherapists, if you've got some past stuff that's just holding you back from everything. Because a lot of women find that as their hormones start changing, past traumas that they've kind of buried, come and just raise their ugly head again and actually maybe they need a counsellor or a hypnotherapist or whoever and and that's always been absolutely key to the hub is that it isn't my place to judge who somebody needs it's my place to provide those people Mm -hmm. so that's why we have a really wide array of experts because everybody's different and we all need different things you know 
Absolutely. And I sometimes also find um, once you start with one thing, you kind of start peeling yeah. the onion, but in a good way, like healing to me is a, or, and, and to me that is, is, is a healing journey um, or supporting yeah. the body to be better. And once you start with one thing, something else might pop up and then you just need a bit of guidance here and there in a different direction, but it just makes you feel so much better in the end. Like look at, and I didn't, I didn't know you when you were 39 right but look at you right now you're full of energy you're you've created these beautiful places virtually <laughs> for people um and you don't at least it doesn't come across to me like at night you're like oh my god I can't like I'm just fried and I can't do anything anymore I think you've sort you know, of I have I have a fairly standard bedtime of about 9 p.m <laughs> oh yeah exactly, which is I'm not exactly the party animal I used to be <laughs> <laughs> my days of dancing on tables till three in the morning seem to be on hold at the moment I think I was gonna say it doesn't mean they're not coming back I'm not saying they're over but they're currently on pause (laughs) um I have very fond memories of the times that they did happen oh Um, yeah they were great but they there's always a time and a place for these kinds of things (laughs) um so how was maybe just briefly we can touch on that a bit how was your sleep? Was sleep one of the things that was that you were struggling with? Yeah, in the first. So, and this was this was really difficult to pinpoint at the time because I happened to switch jobs just <laughs> as everything kicked off, and I'd been training for Ironman triathlons, and I was still trying to do that. And so, my poor body didn't know what was happening. My poor brain couldn't keep up. You know, the job that I'd moved to on paper was spot on. It was ideal for me. And within about three, four weeks of being there, I was stressed to the hilt. I wasn't sleeping. I was miserable. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I was going to bed ever earlier because I seemed to manage to sleep until about midnight, one o'clock, and then be awake until about five. And so I'd find myself like crawling into bed at half seven going, well, maybe, maybe I can just get a little bit more sleep into the bit where I'm allowed to sleep. And then I'd be awake proper awake reading books just Mm. reading and reading and reading and reading because leaving the light off and trying to sleep again was just wasn't going to happen and then that's I would get frustrated and I'd get cross with myself you know that usual cycle we all know the deal (laughs) um and there definitely was a stress aspect to that um I knew I wasn't doing the job as well as I should be Mm. and that was providing a layer of stress and so there was an aspect of that to my poor sleep definitely um with hindsight there was an aspect of the fact that I had over exercised Mm. and I was still trying to over exercise and that was impacting my sleep um I had never realized until I learned it the hard way that over exercise can negatively impact sleep when we all think oh well I'm nice and tired because I've done lots of exercise so of course I'll sleep tonight I didn't know about the wired but tired thing Mm -hmm. um until I learned it the hard way because you know I don't like to listen to people I just like to find out the hard way and go (laughs) oh this is really rubbish I don't feel very good (laughs) um but yeah that job lasted about six months and then I went for my um probation review and they were like yeah this isn't working and I'm like no it's not (laughs) Good that we're on the same page. <laughs> you figured it out. Home now, thanks. Um, and it was like two weeks before my 40th birthday. And I just remember thinking, oh, God. Mm-hmm. I'm looking around me and probably wrongly, but, you know, perceiving that everybody else was sorted in their lives. And, mm-hmm. oh, my God, everybody's got to 40 and they know what they're doing. And here I am like, what? And I remember putting a post on Facebook going, how do you decide what to do when when you when you're a grown up? Like, how do you decide what you want to do? And one of my friends, lots of people commented, which was lovely of them. You could try this job, try applying here, whatever, blah blah blah. And one friend who's a life coach said, um, "We need to work out your core values." Do we? <laughs> Great. Great. <laughs> what are those again? <laughs> I don't know what those are, but that's lovely. I trust you. Shall I bring a cake? <laughs> She's like, "Bring cake, brilliant." Okay. So I went over to hers honestly expecting nothing really Mm -hmm. expecting at best 
a kind of a general notion of the sorts of jobs that I should probably be looking to apply it for. Yeah, came out of there. <laughs> knowing that my core values were being active and helping women to feel epic. So I went and trained as a personal trainer so that I could help people to be active and feel epic. And I enjoy doing that, but that wasn't the actual thing because I still didn't have the word perimenopause at that point. (laughs) (laughs) And then once I got the word perimenopause and started the hub, I was like, oh that's what all the core cool values were about there it is awesome I went, I went massively off on a tangent from your question oh no, <laughs> to- no totally cool I think it's so um at least I think in the health space a lot of us can relate to that because that's kind of how we got where a lot of us I think got to um where we are today that we went through some sort of traumatic health journey had to figure it out mostly by ourselves, potentially with the help of a great coach who we eventually somehow found, yeah. uh, right? <laughs> um, and then took it from there and, and built on it. And I think that's what makes it so valuable that you've had that experience yourself. You can talk to it, right? You have you understand how the women feel. Um, we touched on this briefly before we hit record, and I want to bring that up with perimenopause once more. Um because it's it's big it's a topic that you hear if you tap into that women women's health arena right now i would say it's a topic that you hear a lot of people talk about and yes i didn't tap into that arena before necessarily because a i wasn't affected b i wasn't in that space maybe at that time but and i think it's great that people are starting to talk about it more and and women find a platform to discuss these things but is this a new phenomenon is perimenopause a newer phenomenon because every time I talk to my mom she's like oh no I had like perfect periods to like I was almost 50 I don't remember her having like hot flashes or things like that I think her her menopause journey or journey into menopause was from my perception short and sweet almost like nothing crazy yeah same for my mom and bless her she's she was really worried about me when I had no idea what was going on um and when we eventually got the word perimenopause and whatever she was like oh well I've never heard of that you know she's like my menopause was just a couple of hot flushes and uh and then my period stopped really looking back knowing what I know now she actually did have other symptoms Mm mm-hmm But I don't think she has ever attributed them to being anything to do with her hormones. I think she's just always attributed them to being just one of those things. Mm -hmm. But nothing that was impacting her day-to-day life. That said, shortly after I'd set up the hub, we went for lunch with my godmother, who's the same age as mum. They studied together. And mum was like, oh, tell Anne what you're doing. You know, (laughs) feels a bit awkward you're not meant to talk to that generation about it at all. um so I just said well you know when I've just set up this website and and, and just turned around and went oh, I wish you'd been around when I went through it I went to hell and back oh now this is where I get into a theory I like a theory <laughs> backed up with nothing by the way it's just my thoughts mum was um was able to be at home most of the time, wasn't needing to work. She was the sort of, I mean, frankly, dad couldn't have done his job without mum. So she was incredibly important to the whole setup, but she wasn't going out to work. So she didn't have those external stresses coming on to her. And my godmother worked all the way through. She was um, an ophthalmologist. No, an orthoptist. Something to do with eyes. I don't know. And... And I'm like, hmm, I wonder if there's something in that. Because we know that stress doesn't like hormones or hormones don't like stress. We know that. And we know that over and above the day-to-day stresses of home, life, whatever, if you are also holding down a full-time job, that adds an extra stress. So I have this very, very basic theory 
that because we're the first generation who've been pretty much told that we should want to have it all we should be wanting to have the kids and the job and we can be as much we can do as much as men we can be as much as men even though we're completely different and actually maybe we could just do our own thing in our own way but anyway that's another story I just feel like that underpins a lot of this Absolutely. As I say, I, that's I, just my theory. And there it yeah. is. <laughs> and and I, I totally support your theory. And I have no scientific data on that yeah. either. But I, I feel that is very true. And I think that we, and I see it in a lot of clients, I see it in myself that this, yes, and we want it all. And that's fair. And, and, um, we just have to find a good way to do it. And I think that sometimes where we struggle without knowing, yeah. we just keep going and we burn the candle at both ends forever. And at some point the body says no. Absolutely. And, and that might be for some women, it might only only be in menopause uh, or even menopause or maybe in perimenopause. But I see more and more women, and I can include myself in that, that, um, who've had very stressful events in their life at some point that might have led to burnout. That could have been something traumatic. Um, that really messes with your hormones for a long time. And if you catch that too late, and in my, I would say in my case, it was, I figured it out, but it took a while for, to find somebody who could actually help me to figure it out. It pushes you closer to menopause. I think that's my theory that the more big stressful events we have in our lives, the close, like the, the closer menopause either comes or the, the longer perimenopause and the rougher perimenopause gets. And, but what I see for myself is the more I then look after myself. And this is not eight hours of meditation a day or not doing any work around the house or playing with Henry or working, right? All this is in there, but carving out little islands of me time, yeah. 10 minutes here and there. But if I do that consistently, I do so much better. And I've, I don't want to say I'm pushing that further back again. I've no, we'll see what happens when I get there. Yeah. Right? But every time I something comes closer that is extremely stressful and I then dial down on that call it self-care I don't even really like the word but just to like that I know I have pockets for myself and I feel more grounded and balanced my hormones play a lot a lot better absolutely, absolutely and what I didn't realize at the time when I was doing all these silly triathlon things and stuff was that endurance sport actually is adding another stress into the body. Absolutely. I didn't know that. I was totally of this understanding that exercise is always good. And so unbeknownst to me, I was, and, and at the time I was dieting because I was an idiot because apparently I was too big. I'm rolling my eyes at this point for anybody just listening to the audio. I'm cross with my younger self. Um, <laughs> buying into this idea that I wasn't enough unless I was in a tiny body. Anyway, um, I was putting untold stress on my body mm -hmm. without even realizing it. I genuinely thought that stress was house moves and divorces and big things and that it wasn't those little everyday things. I understand very differently now, but it's, and I think when what you're saying about self-care, I, I agree the term has got, hijacked slightly with mm -hmm. kind of Instagram version of what self-care should look like but for me self-care includes is not limited to by any means it includes not watching the news anymore mm -hmm. it includes taking time to walk my dogs at the pace that I want to walk them at the time that I want to walk them it includes being in nature that is really important for me and I know I struggle if I don't have time in greenery it includes I've started doing a gratitude journal because actually finding finding those positives in among days that can feel quite negative I find really really useful and it just pulls me back around none of that is hearts and petals and bubble bath or whatever I don't like a bubble bath I'm not a fan you know 
I, I fail on, on you know, self-care 101. If you go onto Pinterest, have a hot bath. Oh no, I don't want to, thanks. Um, but also I listen to my body now. And I mean, the other day the car broke down and so I had to cycle to the next place I had to be. And I was like, I know this is gonna be, I'm gonna get some comeback from this because that's what my body does these days. Then my bike broke down, so I had to continue on foot. And actually that was better because it meant my heart rate was lower and actually my body was more in control of itself. And I had to cancel some things. And I was like, well, what do I do? Stress over something that's so far out of my control that I can't change it or just go with it and apologize. And I had to go for the latter because that that's self-care. Absolutely. And I think um, if you do those kinds of things and develop that, I think for some of us that can be courage um, to do that and put yourself in that position. You are going to feel better. You are going to sleep better because you're not stressing. Um, you are going to even address weight issues because a lot of women get weight issues because we're not holding on to all this stress that just builds that cortisol layer of belly tire that we yep. don't want right because then comes the over exercise against specifically the cardio and then we're going to start running 5 10k because we're going to get rid of and that's all counterproductive and then we start saying these things and we're like you're crazy like that's how do i get rid of that i think by slowing down and really, like you said, starting to listen to what we need. And this might not, this might also be a journey. Like you might not be able to put all those things in place tomorrow. I because it's, so, and that's okay. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a big amount of self-acceptance in there as well. So listening to what your body needs and accepting that and not fighting against it and going, right, okay, well, my body has changed shape. It did in puberty as well. You know, when I got to 18, I wasn't mourning the 10 year old shape me because I liked the fact I had curves and that was kind of cool. And I was 18 and boys, woo. Well, my body's changing shape again now. I know I can't wear a size 10 pair of trousers anymore. Has that changed my personality? Has that changed my kindness, my sense of humor? Not a jot. Mm -mm. And I wish I could. I, I would love to be able to envelop every woman in perimenopause in a huge hug that says you're perfect exactly as you are. Okay, let's start from that point and make you feel epic, but you are already perfect. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, and I think that's so important, right? That um, And for that, we need, sometimes we need a bit of space and to, to breathe and to actually think about that and let that settle in or be around other people who are starting to walk that same path yeah I mean for me and this you know everybody's path is different but for me getting away from the diet world was the biggest piece of self-care that I've ever done for myself and my route into that was through um, a book and a um, little community and stuff called Beyond Chocolate, which is, it's lovely. And it's written by this, these two sisters who just simplify intuitive eating and listening to your body. And honestly, that was just like, oh, hold on a second. So I don't have to ever deprive myself, which means I don't ever have to binge because I haven't deprived myself, which means I can just have a normal relationship with food which in turn means I can just have a normal relationship with my body because it's just a body. And, you know, it snowballed for me, that became, well, that was a huge stepping stone to just acceptance. Absolutely. So, yeah. Great. So if people want to get a big hug and feel like <laughs> I want to give everybody a big hug. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hate that's the one downside to being an online community On virtual, yeah. I did I did an in-person event in my local city back in May which was for the third birthday of the hub 
and I hugged every single person that came. I'm like, you're having a hug? <laughs> what do you mean you don't want a hug? You're having one. <laughs> <laughs> and it was lovely. <laughs> but yes, if people would like a metaphorical virtual <laughs> hug, <laughs> um, the, the, the sort of generic hug is available in the Perimenopause Hub um facebook group which i keep everything very simple because we're all going through perimenopause and frankly we don't have any short-term memory it's called perimenopause hub there it is nice and simple <laughs> website perimenopausehub.com really simple let's not complicate life but if you want a slightly more intimate hug not in a weird way <laughs> but it's like closer to the experts and more hugging um, then we've just launched um, the Sleepy Jean Club, which is a membership club. And all the details for all of it is in the Facebook group. Yes. And yeah, that's really where you get more access to the experts. Um, it's a smaller circle of people. It's not 50,000 people. Um, and there's a schedule of things, of events that come where we talk about certain things. It's it's really great. Um, so we will also it's link... it's very up- new. So it's it's still kind of bedding in but it's lovely and it's going to be it's going to be epic it's Um, going to be epic yeah absolutely and we'll link all that in the blog in the show notes so that women can find the perimenopause hub and it was an absolute pleasure having you thank you it's been great fun and um, i'm really looking forward to the collaboration and uh, thank you so much for your time today thank you for having me I love coming on podcasts. It's great fun. (laughs) And I like extending a big virtual hug to everybody. (laughs) Yes. Thank you so much for that. And thank you everyone for listening. Ladies, check out the perimenopause app. If this is a topic for you right now, if it is not for you, but you know, women going through this struggling, please let them know just to have a look. If it's something for them to check out the Facebook group's completely free. The sleepy jean club is very affordable. So um, just spread the word so we can have more women finding this information and get help. And I'm just going to add one tiny little thing. As we have both shown, given that we both started having things changing when we were younger than people would expect, if things are starting to change, just come and join us and have a look around and just see if it feels right. It it isn't just in your 50s and your period stopping. There's There's more. Don't be afraid that it's going to be awful. But forewarned is forearmed, isn't it? And the more you can know and prepare, the better it's going to be. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And we will see you next time. 